Dr. Osler, tell us why standing is not the opposite or a, an antidote to sitting. Yeah. Well, it, it seems obvious that standing is the opposite of sitting because, you know, linguistically, they seem like the opposite. Uh, don't, just, you know, don't just sit there, you know, stand up and do something. It's like, that's, it's, it's just in the linguistic construction. But if you look at the physiology of sitting and standing, as far as the body con is concerned, they're not very different. The body is optimized to use as few calories as possible because um, as we were you know, growing up as hunter-gatherers for the last three million years, every calorie that you needed to eat, you had to go hunt or gather. And, and so the first thing is to use fewer calories, just, just as you know, if you're trying to save energy, the first thing is, um, not to look for cheaper energy sources, but to use less energy. And so evolution tumbled to that very early on. So when you're standing, it turns out that you hardly use any muscular energy. You, you basically just keep all your bones stacked with little flickers of activity in the gastroc and soleus muscles in the, in, in the back of your lower leg that just kind of keep all of your bones stacked. So first of all, you're not using very much energy when you're standing. And the second thing is, um, when people stand up, you know, it, it's not really a comfortable posture for people. I know this for myself because as an academic trauma surgeon for 30 years, I had to stand up on rounds twice a day as medical students would drone on and on about the serum lactate and how long the patient had been. <laughs> they would just talk. And I can stand there for four or five minutes quite comfortably. But after five or 10 minutes, you're leaning against the wall and you're standing on one foot and, and you're just looking for some way to get away from the business that, you know, that standing is basically a stress posture. And if you watch people at standing desks, you know, they're, 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 not, uh, they're not doing Tai Chi. They lock a hip and they lean on the desk to kind of get away from the stress of standing. So um, for a variety of reasons, you know, standing desks don't work out very well. They swept the workplace. I mean, there's a lot of standing desks if you go out and look around now because everybody has kind of gotten the idea that sitting is a catastrophe. So standing is the opposite of sitting. So let's get a standing desk. But if you watch people at standing desks, they're not comfortable. They're kind of leaning on them and trying to get away from them. And I've had people say to me, oh, doctor, you know, I try so hard to stand up at my standing desk all day, but after an hour or two, I just can't stand it anymore. And, and you, you really feel for such people because you know, standing isn't really doing them a great deal of good. This has been studied um, by a, a group, Smith et al. Um, uh, it was published in the American Journal of Epidemiology uh, in 2000, January 2018. They followed 7,300 people for 10 years. Very expensive, very long study in terms of epidemiologic work. Half of these people had sitting uh, jobs, half of them had standing jobs. And those with the standing jobs had twice the rate of heart trouble, heart attacks and stuff like that. This was shocking because we had expected that standing up would be better for people than sitting down in terms of heart health. But the data was very clear. You know, there's no chance that this was a fluke. It, it's, it's a big data set and the, and the size of the effect was very large, doubled the rate of heart trouble. And you can tell that the authors were struggling in the discussion section to explain what had happened. And it seems like when people are standing, there's a column of blood that goes from the right atrium down to your ankle, and it's just static. And when blood isn't moving constantly, and when you're walking, your leg muscles are squeezing the veins and pumping the blood back to the heart. But when you're just standing still, the blood pools, and you really set yourself up for a subclinical hypercoagulable state. And if you have any rough spots in your coronary arteries, um, you can have a myocardial infarction of you, you, you caught off one of the arteries and lose a chunk of heart muscle and, and your life changes in a way that uh, can be catastrophic. So, you know, the idea that, oh, we'll just give everybody a standing desk. Well, it, it was really premature before we had actually studied them. And the studies that have been done on standing desks are profoundly un, unsettling. So, you know, for a variety of reasons, I, you know, I, I think that standing desks aren't really the way forward. They do seem to increase the metabolic rate because no humans are optimized to stand, um, you know, it's still more work than sitting slumped with all of your muscles gone dark, but not much more. So, um, you know, the hoped for metabolic kick isn't as big as we'd hope. And then there are these other problems, um, most profoundly worrisome is the heart trouble. 
but also as a general surgeon for um, two or three decades, I stripped miles of saphenous veins, the, the vein in your lower leg, out of people who'd had standing jobs for decades, perhaps on an assembly line, and the veins in your legs uh, fill overfill with blood from the pressure head of just standing with a column of blood until finally they stretch to the point where they become inflamed, become painful, begin to clot off, and finally have to be removed surgically. And the operation is not a pretty one. Dr. Osler, can you explain what a saphenous vein is? Well, so the saphenous, so, um, you know, blood goes to the arteries and skin, nerves, all the stuff in your leg, then it gathers in the venous system and comes back to the heart. And the saphenous vein is the big vein on the inside of your ankle that uh, you know goes up your leg and becomes the you know the. Is that equivalent to a varicose vein, or is it two separate? No, so a varicose vein is just any vein that's been stretched past its capacity and can't go back to normal. And the saphenous vein is the one that most typically gets into trouble. But any vein can become a varicose vein, and this you know can be stretched to the point where it can't recover. And. and, and Someone asked me what causes varicose veins. Is it just mm -hmm. standing or are there genetic reasons? It, or It's the pressure head of standing. That's basically the whole story. If you're up and around walking or lying down, you don't get varicose veins. Uh, varicose veins are another uh, disease of modernity. You know, it, it doesn't happen in populations that are living uh, closer to the way our hunter-gatherer forebears live. You know, it's, it's, it's like bunions, you know. Until we invented tight shoes, bunions were unknown. You know, so interesting. So one of the things that I think is sort of a, a way of approaching computer use is to have one of the, they make these great monitor risers so you can stand mm -hmm. up. And if you have a, I dictate a lot of my um, correspondence, as you will note from the typos that I have <laughs> found. <laughs> I always have this thing of, you know, if there's something puzzling or, you know, a misspelled word, it's something I didn't catch. But I, I personally like the idea of standing up, marching in place, moving around and talking to my computer rather than straining my hands. Because I have seen, there's a picture on a recent study of, you know, standing with college students and the kids are resting their forearms at the computer, which is one of the biggest no-nos, because it, you know, it really destroys the soft tissue of the upper extremity. So, I think standing up, walking around, and sort of talking is one way of, you know, not standing all day statically, but standing and then maybe sitting a little bit, maybe doing a little fidget sitting, standing back up. But the idea for me personally is to keep moving because I'm the person that you will see at a conference standing in the back because mm -hmm. I just cannot sit in the I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy standing next to you. <laughs> yeah. We'll be marching. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but I'm the guy marching next to you. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's a terrific way to put it. You know, humans are designed to walk and talk. We're not designed to sit and type. Yes. And, and you've kind of broken the code by having a desk that lets you, you know, use your legs in a normal kind of marching in place, heel, toe. Um, they even have, you know, ba balance boards you can surf on for the crazy high performing set that, you know, wants to spend $100 on such a thing. But the idea of standing up and talking, I mean, this is what humans have done for 3 million years. They stand up and talk to people about the jackal they're going to run away from or the rabbit they're going to chase. The business of sitting down and typing, these are workarounds. You know, we sat down in order to get to a way to put letters on paper. And we have a keyboard as a way to like enter letters um, more legibly. But these are workarounds. They're not really good solutions. And they certainly didn't have ergonomics in mind. I've, I've read interesting, uh, uh, so, uh, couple of interesting papers where people say, you know, the old typewriter keyboards were much better for people because, you know, they, it, it, the key strike was, you know, required the whole, they go on and on for pages about how much better exercise is for the hand to be moving through the whole keystroke of a, of a, of a mechanical typewriter rather than just being locked into the speed typing of a modern electronic keyboard. I don't know enough about, well, you could talk to that maybe, um, you know, where the old... Well, 
I, I give a whole lecture on typing and I compare the, the um, typewriter keyboard to a flat slab keyboard and it did force you to use your back and I have beautiful photographs which I will share with you of old typists who had beautiful posture. They never, never, never used a backrest. Mm -hmm. They had gorgeous posture. The problem, I mean, if you were typing with a really neutral wrist and you didn't dorsiflex or ulnar deviate and you're using your, your whole hand, that's better. And also the, the keys of an old typewriter, standard typewriter were counterweighted. So if you ever get a chance to actually go to an antique store and type on one, it's heaven. It's, uh, Deborah, it's a Deborah, I, I, I'm old enough that I owned one in high school. <laughs> well, anyway, those old Remingtons and Royals, and then you also had to do different things. You weren't just king. You, you had to change the, the paper. You had to get up and go to the filing cabinet. And there, re and there was no return. Field. There was no return key. You had to like, you know, push. Yeah, you had to handle. use the baton. And, and um, it was... It was more of a physical thing. The problem is, and I did an episode on this with Dr. Robert Markison. The problem is that we're not meant, it's really not a good idea to be bending your elbow and pronating mm -hmm. because that position, I can't count the number of ways that is destructive to the soft tissue of the upper extremity. Mm -hmm. Plus people rest and when they're resting, they're slouching because they're resting their entire forearm on their desk instead of using the muscles of their back, you know, the erector spinae, the rhomboids, the, you know, all these muscles that keep your shoulder blade where it's supposed to be. So these muscles are getting weak. These muscles are getting tight. The tightness of this muscle chokes up the brachial plexus anyway. It's, it's better than a computer keyboard, but I don't think typing is a good idea. Mm -hmm. No, and, and, as, and as voice dictation software gets better, um, it's all of these millennials with their devotion to texting and typing will seem like uh, dinosaurs as their children are just dictating. Yes, well, hopefully people will get back to more movement. And um, so final question, if... If there were a ratio, would you like to guess, as a doctor, what a good ratio would be? Because I'm, I'm not convinced that standing for an hour, based on what you said, is really going to be comfortable for people. Right. No, I... I Depending uh, on how they do it. No, I think you should change posture as often as you can possibly arrange to do so. Um, and um, so, um, you know, uh, I... Um, I, I, I uh, have several beta testers that I work with who try out different versions of our chair. And I, I dropped off one with one of the oncologists at the University of Vermont uh, uh, day before yesterday. And uh, you know, she stands at her desk and then we have a tall uh, active chair that she can sit on. And then she moves over to some other desk and she sits on a low active chair and then she goes to the water cooler. And then, and then she like, she's, she's constantly switching up posture, but she has the luxury of having her own office and a couple of different uh, chairs and desks that she can like switch around in. And, and I said, boy, you know, and you should add a yoga mat so you can lie down for a while and do a little Feldenkrais. So uh, anyway, the, if you're fortunate enough to have your own office, you can have a variety of different positions that you can adopt just by moving from place to place, you know, more than one chair, a high desk, a low desk. And as I was saying, you know, if you can slip a yoga mat in and lie down and do a little Feldenkrais uh, mini lesson along the way, I actually do that. I have a, a cordless phone and a headset, and sometimes I will lie down with my feet up to get the, the yeah. lymph going the other way, do a little bit of uh, legs up the wall when I'm talking. Right. No, and, and as, as big a trouble, as much trouble as it is to get the blood to come back, lymph is, of course, even slower because it's traveling through these little tiny passageways that you, you, you can't even see, you know, in the operating room, even with magnification. Wow. No, 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 no. And then it, and you think all that lymph comes back. Where? Where is it all going? Good question. It, it just keeps, you know, all these little tributaries keep going together and going together and going together until finally they get up into the thoracic cage 
and they they converge into something called the thoracic duct, which then uh, it inserts into the superior vena cava, and, and which is where the lymph gets poured back into the central circulation. And did you say thoracic nut? No, the thoracic duct. Duct. <laughs> I was going to say this. Okay, go ahead. So, so uh, let's see if I can get it. There, there. What are the three birds in the thoracic cage? The esophagus. Else and the and the thoracic ducts, you know, we, we have little mnemonics to kind of keep all this stuff straight. But anyway, the point that so all of this, all the lymph converges into this little tiny thoracic duct that plugs into the superior vena cava, and it's so diaphanous you can't even see it. But if you disrupt it and as you're rooting around in there doing some operation or other, it's catastrophic because it's how all the lymph gets back into the cir central circulation. So all of these systems are exquisitely designed and um, you know, we don't talk enough about lymph but every uh, every older person and even young people know that at the end of a long day of standing you can see where the top of your socks were if your socks fit tight right i mean uh, yes that's this lymph is couldn't really get back. fascinating so as i understand it the key to lymph is movement the key to lymph is movement but also getting your legs up whenever you can getting the legs up. Well, it's been fascinating talking with you, Dr. Osler. I hope you come back and talk about other things on RSI Help YouTube. Thank you so much for this really fascinating discussion. No, all, always happy. I love these conversations. Yeah, me too. So uh, thank everybody for listening. Please subscribe.